Make sure you're subscribed to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. Type The Word of the Lord Endures Forever in your podcast provider. Hit that subscribe button and leave us a five-star review. This will make it easier for other podcast listeners to find The Word of the Lord Endures Forever. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. My grown daughter told me just the other day that the most terrifying words they ever heard from their mother's mouth were, you wait till your father hears about this. We both laughed heartily, as did my wife. But the kids knew that submission or obedience to their parents was never optional in our household. And when they tried to buck that, well, they would invariably pay a penalty. It didn't mean we didn't love them. It meant that we loved them way too much to let them have their own defiant way. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of 1 Timothy. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. So, you remember in our last study, Paul began differentiating tasks for men and tasks for women. The men were not to use their fists to fight, but to lift up holy hands without anger and quarreling. Hands upraised was the ancient and normal posture of prayer rather than the hands folded that we're accustomed to. The women were not to focus on the externals, the variety of ways that they could beautify the external with braided hair, gold pearls, expensive duds. Instead, they were to wear respectable apparel and strive to be clothed interiorly with modesty and self-control and good works. This is fitting, Paul says, for women who profess godliness. Paul made it clear that women may not hold the office of the ministry, current violations of his order notwithstanding. They are to learn in all quiet submissiveness. They are not allowed to teach authoritatively in the assembly as those who assume the pulpit. Paul lists out two reasons for this prohibition, one rooted in the creation and the other in the fall. In creation, man had the priority. He was created first and woman was created from him. In the fall, man was not deceived, but woman was deceived and she became the transgressor. She presumed to teach Adam that it was okay to eat the forbidden fruit. As a consequence, she is to be silent as far as authoritative teaching in the assembly. And then, There was that mysterious verse at the end about being saved by or through childbirth. The confusion about what Paul meant extended to the translations with the New Living Translation offering no less than three ways of trying to get it into English. I suggest it. We'd do best to wait till we can ask Paul in the light of glory, so what exactly were you saying there? A reading from 1 Timothy, the third chapter, beginning at verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. 1 Timothy 3, verses 1-7. through Let us pray. 
Grant, we beg you, Almighty God, to us and to your whole church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word, as befits it, may not be bound, but a free course, and be preached and taught to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide to our end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to ponder today's passage? Let's dig in. Verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. First, I just have to register my protest over overseer. That is sort of an etymological translation of the Greek, but the church has usually just rendered it as bishop. Jerome in The Latin, the Vulgate, transliterated the Greek word episcopus. Luther rendered it with bischoff, and the King James rendered it with, well, bishop. I think the modern aversion to the word bishop is largely because the translators don't want you to think that by using that term here in the New Testament, Paul is already referring to the fully organized Episcopal structure that arose after the time of the apostles. Don't picture the guy with a pointy hat, fancy robes, and a crozier and pectoral cross. Actually, as it becomes quite clear by comparing this passage to the one we studied earlier in Titus, the New Testament word for what we call a priest or a pastor or a preacher is the same as the word for a bishop. As Lutherans would put it, it just all refers to the office of the holy ministry. So Paul, having ruled out the possibility of that office for the ladies, is about to explain that not just any man should serve in that office either, but only those with certain qualifications. But for a man to want to serve in that office, that's indeed a noble desire. Why is it noble? Because handling the means of grace, sermon, baptism, Eucharist, absolution, that's serving to the church the very instruments whereby God grants his people a share in his own divine life, a share in salvation. So let's look at the list of Paul's qualifications. Verse 2. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Now, You have to be a pastor to realize how much, when we read this verse, we despair. How on earth can we be above reproach when all people are sinners and we know our own sins and our own failings so well? Well, I think the key is to punctuate the verse a little differently. I suspect what Paul was saying was that there should be a colon after the above reproach. In other words, he's not talking about being sinless. But he is talking about possessing the following characteristics. That's the above reproach Paul is talking about. So let's begin unpacking his list. First up, the husband of one wife, or more literally, a one-woman man. Note how that incidentally confirms that the office is entrusted only to males. The New Revised Standard Version is very naughty and eliminates the reference to man or husband by paraphrasing married only once. Now, that is what Paul meant, but he means men who have been married to only one woman. Yes, he rules out remarriage after divorce for those serving in the ministry. Ironically, Rome does not even permit her priests to be married at all, at least in the Latin rite. This, despite Peter supposedly being the first pope and his wife traveling along with him. Check out 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5. Now, the man writing this, St. Paul, he was never married. So I don't think you can hear him saying here that pastors must be married. He rather intends to say, if married, then only married once. To be sober-minded means to be serious, for it's a serious task that ministers are given. Self-controlled, I think, is better translated with prudent, Respectable, hospitable, they're self-evident. But do notice that last item, able to teach. That's crucial. The bishop or pastor's task is above all to impart the word of God, and that means being able to teach other people. Paul continues unpacking above reproach with the following. Verse 3. 
not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Drunkard now does not mean someone who drinks, but a person who is so out of control with their drinking of alcohol that they're what we would term a drunk. The liquor runs their lives so that they live to get the next drink. It's the attitude described in Proverbs 23, 35. When shall I wake? I must have another drink. Violent is self-evident, not a brawler. Instead, being gentle. Boy, do we need to hear that next one. Not quarrelsome. That means beyond just being violent with the body, not being one of those people who's always spoiling for an intellectual battle either. And of course, no lover of money. If the pastor is to teach others that they cannot serve both God and mammon according to Jesus' own word, he needs to make sure that his heart has not been given to that idol either. Anything else? Yes, also this, verse 4. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Verse 5, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So, Paul depicts the pastor not only as having a wife, but ordinarily having children, and he is to be a good manager of his household. His point is sound. Look, if a man can't figure out how to keep his children submissive to the authority God has entrusted to him, how can you expect him to be able to take care of God's church? Chrysostom explained to his congregation in 4th century Antioch, even those who are without the church have the saying that one who is a good manager of a house will be a good statesman. For the church is, as it were, a small household. The church is the household of God. My grown daughter told me just the other day that the most terrifying words they ever heard from their mother's mouth were, you wait till your father hears about this. We both laughed heartily, as did my wife. But the kids knew that submission or obedience to their parents was never optional in our household. And when they tried to buck that Well, they would invariably pay a penalty. It didn't mean we didn't love them. It meant that we loved them way too much to let them have their own defiant way. Paul goes on, verse 6. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. St. Ambrose always comes to mind when this verse creeps up. He was a catechumen when the people of Milan thrust him into the office of bishop. He was baptized, ordained a deacon and a priest, and then put into the bishop's office within weeks. The result might have been what Paul warns about here. Thanks be to God, though, it wasn't. Ambrose humbly said more than once that he had to learn even as he was teaching, since he didn't have the leisure to learn before he had to teach. And surely the Lord gave him the grace of great humility none of which means that it's wise for the church to ignore Paul's warning here. Pride is the besetting sin of the office of the ministry, and it's fostered whenever a pastor gets to think of himself as some sort of a wonderkin and a real gift to the church. Lord, spare us that. Verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. This last qualification is that the pastor not be involved in public scandals that bring disgrace and that can lead him into the snare that the devil is setting for him. Satan is definitely gunning for those who are in the office of the ministry because he knows full well that ensnaring them in some public shame or disgrace many times leads to his capture of other souls who just write off the church as a bunch of hucksters. So, Paul wants the pastors to be conscious of their reputation in the community. Not that they become people pleasers, but that they are known as men of integrity. So, that's Paul's rundown on what it means to be above reproach. Just as he had excluded all women, so now he has whittled down the men. Only some will be qualified, and yet even of them, They will all confess, in the words of 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. That's where we'll call our halt for today. Next up, Paul will do a similar list for those who hold the office of deacon in the church. Till next time, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.